Welcome everyone. We're delighted you're able to join us today for a sustainability fo forum focused on adaptation and resilience. It's my great pleasure uh, to be here with the really inspiring women uh, that are moving the field forward, helping protect the health, safety, and general welfare of our communities and our places and our people. Um, I do want to point out, my name is Missy Stoltz. I'm the head of the Office of Sustainability and Innovations in the city of Ann Arbor. And this Sustainability Forum series is brought to you by the Office of Sustainability and Innovations, generally in partnership with the Ann Arbor District Library. Of course, we had to move to the virtual realm, given uh, the need to physically distance at this moment. So we appreciate you all being here. Did want to let you know that we are recording today's discussion so that we can air this through means such as community television network or CTN. For today, we've got three wonderful speakers. We did have four speakers. I do want to acknowledge up front, um, Armando Falcone was not able to join us. He is with the Red Cross. He is the Regional uh, Community Partnership Manager, and he's been called into action uh, today due to some pretty intense flooding and some cascading impacts associated with that. So uh, we're sorry to lose Armando, but we're really excited about the speakers that we do have. And let me just very quickly uh, introduce those speakers and I can share a little bit more about them as we move forward. For today, our very first speaker will be Beth Gibbons. Beth is the Executive Director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. She is a vanguard and a connector in the field of adaptation and resilience and has really um, pushed hard to bring in equity considerations into the work that is unfolding in the community of practice, those who identify as adaptation practitioners or who do adaptation as part of their job and are looking for a community. So we're excited to have Beth. Thank you for joining us today. Following Beth, we'll have Rebecca Esselman, who is the Executive Director of the Huron River Watershed Council, a preeminent watershed council that we are lucky enough to have literally in our backyard here in Ann Arbor. Uh, before being the executive director, Rebecca ran the climate programs and was instrumental and continues to be instrumental in integrating climate change into all of the things that the Watershed Council does. Um, and we are incredibly uh, thankful for her service and the work that she does. And I'm delighted to hear what she has to share with us today. And then lastly, we have Elizabeth Santiago, who's a Resilience Fellow in the Office of Sustainability and Innovations. She recently graduated with her degree in public health. Uh, she has been doing a lot of really important work thinking about the intersectionality between climate change, public health impacts, equity and justice, and um, is a really inspiring person who is going to go on and uh, change the world. And we're excited to have her in our, our worldview for a little while. So um, with that, just a, a few notes. Uh, you were all muted upon entry. We do have a Q&A function. So if you have questions, please feel free to put those into the Q&A box. That's at the bottom of the screen. I'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, we will take brief pauses after to answer any clarifying questions from uh, the panelists that you may have. And then we'll leave time at the end uh, where we can unmute folks. You can raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can ask your questions directly to the panelists. Many of you also submitted questions in writing. And so if you don't uh, want to ask questions or we have lulls, I'll be referencing those questions to the panelists. With that, I think it's time to begin. So Beth, over to you. Thanks, Missy. Um, as Missy said, I'm Beth Gibbons. I'm the Executive Director at the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Um, in addition to that, I live in Ypsilanti. And so I have a a lot of interest in conversations that we have locally around climate adaptation and climate resilience. I serve on the Sustainability Commission here in Ipsy and think about you know, what are the ways that Ipsy as an individual community can build sustainability and resilience. And then of course, what is our relationship um, to Ann Arbor and to the broader region? So I'm really interested in the opportunity for a conversation um, you know, in the midst of this presentation and following of where we're all going together. Resilience journey. Um, I'm going to be talking for about 20 minutes. Elizabeth, don't be afraid to give me the hook if I'm running late. Um, I do sometimes. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the state of climate and climate adaptation and resilience. I'm going to talk about um, the integration of climate change and COVID-19 response to recovery, as well as what resilience means in the context of each of these crises, which we are um, in and facing and will continue recovering from. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about 
incremental and transformative change with some tools that hopefully will be useful for you to take forward from this conversation and think about how to be directing your work and activities. Ms. Beth, one quick note that you, we are seeing your presenter mode, so it's not in person. Oh. Interesting. Okay. Um, hmm. Give me just a second to switch uh, display settings. Are you now seeing the? Yeah, that looks great. Beth. Thank you. Okay. Um, give me one more minute and let me just see if I can actually get this to, um, let me see if I can just get it to share screen so that I have a presenter screen, um, in front of me. And that's not going to happen. Oh, swap presenter view. There we go. Now is it working? All right. We talked about the roadmap. Um, just a little bit about ASAP. ASAP is a professional network. We work to connect and support climate adaptation professionals to advance innovation and excellence in the field of practice. And we do this using a network model, which means really leaning into these values of open access, being member driven, um, relying on trust where members share successes as well as failures. Um, and believing in reciprocity. So as members of ASAP, people expect to give and to get and everyone gain. So we use principles that some people may be coming more familiar with that are also talked about often lately in mutual aid. Um, and that if we can support everybody in this network together, we will be able to advance and innovate our practice together more rapidly. Good. Um, ASAP's and membership and interest evolution over time has gone from wanting to have a place for networking, peer, peer learning, um, a place where people can access promising practices, to really kind of evolving um, as the field of climate adaptation and resilience have also evolved to identifying collaborators, to understanding a marketplace where there are more and more um, kind of interactions and transactions around adaptation and resilience, and really getting into the implementation of best practices. So moving from just understanding what they could be just doing assessments, actually implementing things on the ground. Um, as ASAP has been evolving, a really important piece of this has meant that we also have to understand kind of where we are in the state of climate change, as well as where we are in the relationships between characters and actors that support climate adaptation and resilience. So very briefly, um, I think that if any of you heard me speak before, I really love talking about this uh, framing of how we think about climate change at a global, regional, and local level. When we think about climate impacts, global trends are much more certain than regional trends. Um, we have a clear idea of where we are going, um, and we have a clear idea of what we need to change um, to to manage that global, um, you know, the global trend that we're on. When we get into regional effects of climate change, things become a bit noisier. We start to see the role of um, the Great Lakes in our region as really impacting the way that weather behaves. So the Great Lakes are really the engine of our weather system um, and really have a tremendous impact, impact on the way that um, we experience climate and we experience that in our day-to-day -day lives as weather. Local changes in, in land use and in decisions can then really alter the way that climate impacts feel on the ground. And so this is kind of at the core of the adaptation and resilience discussions is that we understand what the global changes are. We can predict and prepare for regional impacts in the choices that we make locally, um, the way that we support our social systems, the way that we think about our um, built environment, the way that we integrate and respect our natural environment, means a change in the way that we feel climate impacts. And so it provides us really a place to have a tremendous amount of impact to really um, understand how you as an individual, how your neighborhood, how your city is able to prepare and respond to climate change. And, and at ASAP, and I really recommend at all places, that adaptation work when it's done well, always includes mitigation. Um, adaptation without mitigation, uh, really, of course, just leads us further into this hole that we've been digging for ourselves. And so it is with this adaptation mentality 
where we are thinking about the impacts in our backyard, that we can also really feel this connection to the global story that we're all trying to affect, that we're all part of it. It's critically important for us that we um, take these actions because the impacts of climate change are only increasing. Um, this slide, of course, is a slide which shows stunning data points. Uh, the 2019 billion dollar weather and climate disasters, there were over 14 uh, disasters declared, or there were 14 billion dollar or more disasters declared in the US in 2019. Um, but what we really miss when we talk about these is the million dollar disasters or the disasters at the household level, which cost a thousand or several hundred dollars, whether that is somebody's basement flooding, whether it is um, having your power knocked out and not having a source to be cooling your house during a um, extreme heat event or an extreme cold event. Um, so the billion dollar disasters kind of capture the spotlight and they tell us how these storms, these fires, these floods are increasing across the country. But we also know that locally and at the household level, um, impacts are also increasing and those costs, while they may be less, are equally disruptive and equally in need of response. There's a lot of shifting context in the climate world in the last year. Um, I'm sure many of you participated, and I'll talk about this in a later slide, participated in the climate strikes um, here in Ann Arbor, or there in Ann Arbor. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of company in my, in my office. Um, but one of the really important changing contexts that we were seeing as we were going through 2019 into early 2020 was the emergence of the private sector as really taking um, a lead and beginning to have a strong voice in the need for adaptation and need for greater physical resilience of, um, of infrastructure, of assets. And this quote from Larry Fink, who came out and said in, in January that companies need to be thinking about the impact of climate change on their long-term prospects and to be continuing to be um, receive investment from BlackRock that it was going to be necessary that you're assessing your climate risk. As we look at other aspects that are affecting um, climate change, I don't know how much background noise you guys are picking up. <laughs> A little bit. Um, yeah, we talked about these, you know, the 14 billion, the 14 billion dollar disasters of 2019, um, the, you know, regional impacts of climate change, lake levels here, wildfires in the west, rising seas, of course, as most people, many people may have heard, um, we're likely going to be seeing a severe hurricane season. Um, and we see a prediction for that in what the um, water temperatures are and we're just you know we're gearing up to see a severe season ahead of us. However, we've also seen a big uptake in the way in which we begin assessing the value of action on um, to deal with these impacts. Um, there's whole suites of cost benefit analysis tools that are now available and cost benefit analysis tools that allow us to understand what the um, what the value is when we begin thinking about social equity, when we start thinking about the environmental benefits of adaptation and tools that allow us to really understand um, avoided losses, which has been something that has really been difficult for the adaptation and resilience field to measure in the past. Um, we see new and really interesting standards being adopted by companies, especially. Um, one of these, which I'll talk about a little bit more in depth, is called the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. This is a set of recommendations where companies are being rec recommended to disclose their physical risk. And this particular piece of recommendation and reporting is important because corporations are seeing it and they're beginning to report their risk. And in doing so, they're reporting the risk of their supply chain and the risk of their facilities. And the upshot of that is that it is leading to um, a greater impetus for municipalities and for states to also be thinking about how they report their risk. And so through the evolution of the improvement of how we recognize events, how we cost those events, 
how we see the benefit of action. Um, we're really seeing more partnerships coming together. And in the case of where we see public and private partnerships coming together, we've seen um, a number of municipalities begin to take a lead on using these, what I call TCFD, the Task Force on Carbon Financial, Climate Financial Disclosure, um, using TCFD categories in their own municipal risk reporting. This is really important because it relates to other um, activities that are happening in the bond market. Um, municipalities all have bond ratings. And one of the most important um, entities which provides those ratings is Moody's. And Moody's had announced a couple of years ago that they were going to begin assessing the climate risk as part of municipalities bond rating. And last year, they acquired a company called 427, which is a company that does climate risk reporting. And so Moody's has not only now said that they're going to begin assessing this risk, they now have brought in-house um, the tools and the people to make that possible. So, so we see this kind of growing need where we have um, municipalities, which have been adapting. I mean, municipalities have not had the opportunity to politicize away the impacts of climate change. Um, they're felt in our communities. They're typically felt disproportionately in our communities, um, with people who are most vulnerable. And, and municipalities that are looking out for the good of their people have been thinking about how do we adapt, how do we respond to climate change. Um, with Moody's now bringing in 427, we see this bond rating component. And when the task force on financial disclosure coming online, we see corporations disclosing and now companies and municipalities coming together so that they're showing kind of shared um, view of what climate risk means to them. Really powerful kind of coupling, especially when we look at what happens at the state or the federal level in our country, where there's a real lack of action, um, local municipalities and companies have an opportunity to move the needle. And of course, they're not alone. Um, you know, municipalities, corporations alone are not the entities that we want leading us to solutions. We want solutions to be built um, in the grassroots. We want them to be from movement builders. We want them to be rooted in these principles of justice and equity and inclusion. Um, so much of what we heard, I think, in 2019 has been um, a message which we're experiencing and hearing again today um, as we're going through this COVID-19 pandemic of what is the way in which we're going to address a climate crisis that is going to be um, solutions for all, not just solutions for some. And this movement has really taken hold. Um, it's taken hold so much that <clears throat> when you start seeing the municipalities and you see corporations and you see the crass roots and you see the movement builders, you start to give way to see coalitions built and policymakers move. And we saw that too in 2019. Um, we saw really interesting and exciting activities. Um, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to read the Green New Deal, I recommend you do. It's 11 pages long. It's quite short. Um, and it's also really um, open. It is a vision. It is a vision for what it looks like to have a economy that is kind of holding principles of being climate um, resilient, being carbon neutral, thinking about justice um, at its core, and it's very exciting. We have the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Um, there's a Dem Senate Democrat Special Committee on the Climate Crisis and an Environmental Justice Initiative. And together, these entities at the federal level, um, we're working to develop really sound mitigation adaptation policy. And I would say that they still are at play. Um, they are informing what's happening now with our stimulus and recovery dollars that are coming out from COVID-19 response. So that was the presentation that I would have given if I gave this presentation in February, probably. But it's not anymore. Um, it's not February and we're now living in a very different time. Um, and nonetheless, COVID-19 being part of our day-to-day -day lives more intensely and deeply than um, anybody would really like it to be, um, climate change is too. And the fact of having to cope with and respond to COVID-19 has not in any way lessened the fact that we need to cope with and respond um, to climate change as well. 
And so I know that there was a specific question in the group of questions that came in ahead of this presentation of what is resilience and why do we use that framing? And so I want to offer um, a little perspective on resilience and then I'm going to talk about some ways in which we can think about COVID-19 recovery and COVID res resilience in two pandemics um, coupled with climate resilience. So one formula of resilience that's used is adaptation plus mitigation plus social justice and equity brings you to climate resilience. We also think about this quote, which comes from the Kresge Foundation, that resilience calls us to eradicate inequalities so that all people will have a chance to adapt and thrive in a fast changing world. This is a model of resilience that calls us to think about bouncing forward instead of bouncing back. It calls us to say um, where we are today is not where we want to remain. It's not where we want to return to. And we want to be thinking about a future that is transformed um, and a future that is for all. As we think about that future and we think about the language that we want to use, um, I'm a language agnostic when it comes to resilience and adaptation. I really like people to do very good practice. Um, and I think that one piece of the resilience language that we have to be cautioning ourselves of is a lot of systems that we don't want are highly resilient. And so when we think about resilience, we have to think about the way that we harness these ideas of resilience to eradicate inequalities, to bounce forward, um, and to really find ways to use this to eliminate the hold that resilient systems have on us, resilient systems in our social inequalities and systemic racism and social injustice. Um, because those systems are going to try very hard to hold on as we go through this response and recovery from COVID-19 and as we build a response um, and greater action to I wanted to provide this, it was kind of a specific call out for one question. We can talk more about um, the language around it as we get into Q&A opportunities. But I want to present these kind of five ideas um, on reflections on the climate crisis and COVID-19. And these were ideas that I did not come up with on my own. Um, they were a product of a series of conversations which ASAP hosted with our members. And then one of our members, Joyce Coffey, um, kind of reflected on the conversations that were held in those spaces and created this summary of where are we now, where are we going, and what do we need to be keeping in mind. And so these kind of five points that so we're going to need to be thinking about financial response, cascading impacts, resilience, jobs in the economy, and fatigue. So when we think about financial response, the point here is that in responding to COVID-19, we have seen the immense power that financial institutions can have and can put toward response when they have the will and the direction to do it. And so this has been a moment for us to really see what financial action can bear when we have the willingness to actually throw funding behind policies that we want to see. About five minutes back. Yep. When we think about cascading impacts, we have seen this really, um, you know, painfully laid out for us that um, COVID-19 shows how a single type of an event, a pandemic, can have these cascading social economic impacts and that it has opened our eyes. It has opened up our ability, we hope, to be able to help people understand the scale, the scope, and the depth of the chaos that this kind of cascading impact could have on our economies and on our welfare. We've learned a lot about resilience. We've learned a lot about the importance of having a plan, the importance of having strong institutions, scientific data and managerial skills. In places where there is a strong team, in communities where there has been coordination, collaboration, we've seen programs be able to be established that are getting food distributed to families who are no longer able to get their foods at school. So here in Ypsilanti, we had YCS immediately stand up a program, working with churches and community groups to create food drops. And I know similar programs have happened across the country. That kind of preparedness, knowing where your families are, knowing where it's safe for them to go, knowing 
um, how you can direct and coordinate a response is incredibly important. And it also is said to us that these are ways in which we need to be prepared to deal with a pandemic, but also deal with food security. Um, and so our ability to pat our head and rub our belly has gotten stronger. And that's going to serve us well as we have to be able to guard against multiple perils at the same time. When we think about the jobs and economy, we see this opportunity that is ahead of us right now, that there is tremendous investment. You start thinking about the infrastructure deficit in this country. The infrastructure across the country is rated at a D minus. To bring the infrastructure in the country up to a C plus, the takes an investment of 2.9 trillion, which was a number that I used to say to people and feel like it was unrealistic. And it's very possible that by the end of next week, we're going to see a $3.3 trillion infrastructure bill pass out of our federal government. And so we suddenly see this moment where, while there is a lot of pain, there's also a lot of opportunity to think about the jobs and the economy that we want to be building toward. And it's really important that we're doing this all together because globally leaders are tired. The statewide, they're tired. In our communities, they're tired. In our households, they're tired. Um, and so the need for us to be working with empathy and with leaders from all sectors and all scales who are working to solve this current crisis, but also open up that window, open up the storm window, open up the screen of opportunity so that we're able to move through it together is critically important. You may have noticed throughout the thread of this, I tried to find pictures of kids too, because the story for us is really about an urgent response to COVID-19. But as we think about <laughs> this fatigue, as we think about the workforce, as we think about the resilience, if we're not thinking about the next generation, then there's no point in thinking about any of it. Um, these changes are upon us. The moment is now. We need to be thinking holistically about our response and so, anyway, so I wanted to use pictures of kids. This is my own kid, who I think is adorable. That was like about an hour and a half ago when I walked out of my office and found him passed out on the couch. <laughs> um, I know we're out of time, and so I won't um, belabor this, but you know, as we move forward, we need to be doing um, this work together. This is a time where incremental changes provide us with demonstrable successes, um, transformational change, is to challenge the status quo and will lead to authentic advancement. And we need to change what we can right now. And then I have this quote, which was, what we can predict, we can prevent. And this was a quote that was told to me by Jackie Patterson, who is the director of the NAACP's Climate and Environmental Justice Program. And she said that because she had prepared a list of what she was worried would happen under COVID-19. What she was concerned would be the impact on brown and black and indigenous people. And then she watched those concerns play out. And so in response, she wrote down what the predictions were and what the policy recommendations are to respond. And she said, we need to do these responses because what happened wasn't a surprise. And if we could predict it, then we are able to prevent it. The last two slides or three slides are kind of resource tools for you to pick up and take home when these are sent out. This is a transformative change matrix. It's something Joyce Coffey made when she was working at the city of Chicago during the economic recession, during the Great Recession. She cut this table as a way to identify what the needs were of her colleagues and to write them down and to be prepared that when there was funding, when there was policy appetite, when there was a moment to move these things forward, she had them ready. And she used it for months and years to move forward what it was she heard her colleagues asking for when they were in really the time that straits were most dire. The selection of resources to pick up, um, these were put together by ASAP members to kind of help guide uh, where we are on COVID-19. And lastly, for folks who want to get involved through ASAP, we have a number of member response action areas, um, members who are gathering and generating resources on learning from pandemic recovery, policy and advocacy, communicating these connections with climate and pandemics and supporting job seekers. So um, 
I want to thank you very much for letting me come in and letting me talk about this and hopefully weaving this together in a way that is filling the, the goal of climate resilience, um, the climate resilience in the world that we're in today. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Beth. That was, that was wonderful and really touched on a lot of the questions that we've seen come in. And I am excited to go into the Q&A session a little bit later with folks. Before we go on, though, um, you did use the term mitigation and adaptation, which are fairly ubiquitous, ubiquitous to us in the field itself. But would you mind quickly defining them for those who may not know? Yeah, I'm sorry. And I would say that a lot of my presentation may have come off as a little bit technical, and I'm happy to unpack any of that, any of that language. Um, in climate action, you can think of having two sides of a coin. The mitigation side is the actions that we take to reduce carbon in the atmosphere, um, to cut down on greenhouse gases, and um, the adaptation side is what we're doing to respond to the changes that are already with us. Um, so the impacts of climate change are already being felt, um, and they require response, and so where we need to respond to climate change already is the adaptation side of the house. And, um, and I know that you know, the A20 plan does an amazing job of threading these two things together um, in the way in which we can get to you know, net zero while also really taking on climate adaptation and, and resilience head on. And so um, I don't know, I think it's a really nice resource for the definition of those terms. Um, and happy to talk more about that. Thanks, Missy. Sorry, yeah. Jorgen. No, that's great. Thanks, Beth. Uh, just a reminder to folks, we do have a Q&A box that's at the bottom of the screen if you have questions that come up. And at the end of our presentations, we're going to open the floor for active Q&A, but I don't want you to lose any questions if you have them. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Rebecca Esselman, who is the Executive Director of the Huron River Watershed Council. Rebecca, over to you. You are on mute, friend. Okay, let's see if we can get this going here. Um, okay. Beth, how did you get it so that you could see your notes as well? In the, the uh, let's see, so. Is it, was it in um, PowerPoint? It was, I think actually a function um, in Zoom. Do you have two monitors? No. Oh, I have two monitors. If you don't have two monitors, then you can't see your notes. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, good thing I printed them. See? It's the second time. <laughs> Prepared. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably true. I'm not seeing an option to do that. So, okay. All right, but you are seeing my slides now, correct? All right. Um, okay, so. Uh, what I'm going to do with my 20 minutes with you this evening is to ask you to step outside of Ann Arbor for a moment, uh, look out past city boundaries, and to consider uh, the broader context of our region. So through our city, we know runs the Huron River. It connects you to your watershed neighbors. And because of the nature of watersheds, you are inextricably tied to these watershed neighbors. Your well-being is linked to actions that they do or do not take, and their well-being is linked to actions that you do or do not take. You're downstream of some of them, others are downstream of you. So when it comes to water, um, the climate crisis begs us to look at this watershed scale when we're thinking about the problem. Understanding the connections between you and your watershed neighbors I think is a really critical element to developing the solutions necessary to adapt to a changing climate. Uh, you're going to see this if you haven't already um, in the A20 plan to a certain extent. So strategies to build resilience in Ann Arbor often require 
cooperation uh, with these watershed neighbors. My screen to advance. There we go. Okay. So before I go any further, um, let me define this neighborhood for you if you're not familiar with it yet. Uh, what is a watershed and where is yours? Um, so this is the Huron River watershed. Um, the dotted boundary in white is the watershed boundary. And essentially, um, I like to think of it this way. When it rains, every drop of water that hits the land area inside that white boundary eventually ends up in the Huron River unless it evaporates. You can kind of think of it as a sink where the drain is at um, the bottom of the watershed at Lake Erie near Flat Rock. So this water connects you to Dexter, to Chelsea, Brighton, all the way up to Milford, down to Ypsilanti and Flat Rock. And then all of the concrete, forests, agriculture, wetlands, homes, and residences residences in between. You can see the Ann Arbor is a little bit toward the bottom of this watershed, a little closer to the drain than not. And this means that your drinking water travels through all of these communities before reaching the water treatment plant. It's this watershed concept that makes it a problem for Ann Arbor when a contaminant like PFAS it's uh, Wixom up in Norton Creek. So water is this great connector uh, for better or for worse. And I wanna spend some time this evening talking about those connections, how climate change is affecting our water and how we can prepare our river and communities to handle the changes. Which is essentially um, in a nutshell or in a term building resilience. Um, I also will um, end with some thoughts on how coronavirus is amplifying the importance of clean water and healthy natural systems, which is something that I've been reflecting on a lot over the last couple months. Uh, to frame this conversation, I just want to briefly characterize the changes in climate we're looking at for our area. Climate can be distilled down in simplest terms uh, to changes in temperature and precipitation. And looking at this graphic, you can see that projections show that by the middle of this century, Michigan's gonna feel a lot more like Missouri, and by the end of the century, a lot more like Oklahoma. The five warmest years on record have occurred since 2015. And this has resounding implications for human health and for ecosystems. As we are mobilizing around climate mitigation, and thank you for defining these terms, Beth, because I'm going to use them too. <laughs> As we mobilize around mitigating climate change to avoid the catastrophe of, um, of climate changes, we also have to prepare for this inevitable change that is and will continue to occur as a past result of our, our bad behaviors <laughs> um, and our greenhouse gas emissions that are already in the atmosphere. Precipitation for now is where Southeast Michigan is seeing the most change. This graphic shows historical data. So in other words, this is what's already played out. Um, it's not a projection or a model. Um, it is what we have seen. And what you can see here is that we have experienced significant increases in precipitation totals in every decade since the 1970s. The 2010s were our wettest decade in Michigan's recorded history. 2019, last year, was the second wettest year on record for the U.S. and the wettest ever for Michigan. If anybody can remember back to last spring, it, it was incredibly wet uh, spring and early summer here. Um, this is also showing up in the news. Um, you may have been reading or seeing headlines about Great Lakes water levels and the impacts to our coastal areas. Uh, 
but all this extra water affects us inland too. Our water tables have been well above normal. Our water table is the level at which um, water is, groundwater is beneath the, the surface of the land. Those have been um, well above normal in the Huron River and the river itself has been flowing higher season for season compared to any period in recent memory. Since May of 2009, so this time last year, the flow of the river has been consistently higher than average. Last night's rainstorm <laughs> guarantees this will perpetuate at least a little bit longer. And these high water levels are more than just a nuisance. They create public health risks. Water in basements can lead to mold and lasting structural damage. Farm fields remain wet well into the planting season, interfering with the grower's ability to earn a living. This played itself out in Michigan last year. Flooding of contaminated sites can result in pollution spreading to surrounding areas, including the river. And high flows on the river can be dangerous for paddlers and anglers and other recreation. We've had, we have several canoe and kayak rental businesses in the watershed, um, including skips near Dexter and several Ann Arbor liveries. Last year, they had to delay or limit their, ser their service due to unsafe and high flows. They're having to do this again with the impacts of COVID. And you can only imagine getting hit two years in a row with a major impact, uh, what that can do to a business. And not only are we seeing more water overall, we're seeing um, the most intense storms become more powerful and more frequent, and they're delivering a greater per percentage of our total precipitation um, in downpours rather than sprinkles. So the, these types of events, these downpour events are the ones that lead to surface flooding, to flash flooding, to dangerous conditions that can open overburden um, our aging infrastructure, like stormwater pipes and dams. And they are the types of events that lead to significant runoff, which is the water that goes directly to the river um, instead of traveling via the soil and groundwater. Um, that runoff carries with it the soil and pollutants um, that it picks up along the way. And then this polluted runoff threatens our drinking water supply, both from the Huron, <clears throat> where Ann Arbor gets its drinking water, but also downstream in Lake Erie, which serves much of the metropolitan Detroit area with drinking water. Then there's the interplay of uh, temperature and precipitation um, that can have um, additional impacts. Uh, one example that I'll share today, because we're starting to see this more frequently in our region, are algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms produce dangerous conditions for both people and wildlife. We see warmer lake temperatures coupled with a longer warm season increases in these runoff precipitation events, delivering nutrients to our waterways, greater fertilizer runoff, more sewer discharges. All of this mixes together to create what you're seeing on the screen here and causes all sorts of problems for recreation, the economy, drinking water, and wildlife. Uh, this uh, type of event is what led to the Toledo water crisis a handful of years back. And we expect to see more of this in the future. So the case I want to make to you today is that investments in maintaining and restoring a functioning Huron River system makes us less vulnerable to climate change impacts, as well as the other shocks, as well as other shocks, including public health crises like the coronavirus. There's a bit of a yin and a yang here. If we protect the watershed, the watershed protects us. I wanted to um, transition now to a short film, uh, change up the format for you guys um, for a moment here that shares a few ways that the Huron River Watershed Council is helping the river adapt to changing conditions 
And then I'll spend some time sharing actions that um, Ann Arbor and other communities can take um, to use natural systems to build resilience in your community. Uh, it's going to take me just a minute to switch over um, to the film. And if somebody can let me know if the audio is coming through okay, um, that would be great. Okay, are you seeing the, the film? Okay. Are you hearing the film? We are not, Rebecca. I think you have to share again the way we did before. Okay. Yep, there we go. Okay, let's try this. Okay. Are you hearing it? No, we're not. Mm. Mm. Let's try this. <laughs> No. Okay, I'll try one more time and if this doesn't work. Justin Shell says you have to have Zoom play the audio of the computer. <sighs> that worked before. Okay, it says I'm sharing computer sound. Now I share screen. Ah, checkbox. Fingers crossed. There is no doubt that climate change is impacting the Huron River already, and the Huron River Watershed Council wants to be proactive to prepare this river for a new climate future. In Southeast Michigan, we're seeing our air temperatures increase, and we're seeing changes in precipitation patterns. When our air temperatures increase, the water temperature increases, and those changes in rainfall patterns lead to changes in flow patterns, and both of those have implications for the wildlife in the river. We've been able to implement three different strategies. We've been protecting the forests alongside the river, restoring habitat within the stream where we have very little, and we've been working with dam operators to improve flow management in the Huron. This is what I would characterize as a healthy river. You've got the trees, you've got the brush, you can see areas of shade. I've always thought that this is just a great spot here. A lot of people don't believe that climate change really exists, but I, I think that's blind. We have to be cognizant when we're looking at plans for uh, developments. One of the things that I'm most proud of is our tributary overlay district. We took the same standards that you have in a natural river district and applied that to all of the tributaries that feed water into the Huron River. The ultimate result is less water runoff. Less water runoff is less erosion. Cooler temperatures in the river, because that's ultimately what we're looking to do, is to cool down the rivers, keep them cool, and not let them warm up. It's a premise shared by my township board that the river is only as good as the water you're putting into it.
Six months ago, we brought about 20 trees down in this section so that they would remain as fish habitat. Fish need diverse water flow. The problem we have in Ypsilanti is that there's not much natural flow variation. It's about the same depth. It's about the same velocity all the way across. When we put in these trees, we are increasing that flow diversity. We're getting faster water coming around the edge. That can cause some scour, which means we're, we're washing away sands and muck, exposing the substrate that these fish want to form their spawning beds in. On the downstream side of the trees, we have these nice slow water zones. These are places that fish like to hide where they can be safe. Patterns in flow provide cues to wildlife in the river that are very important to their success. So for example, our smallmouth bass spawn in the spring. If they experience large changes in flow very rapidly year after year, then the populations of those bass uh, will decline. So in the Huron River, we have this very unique situation. Our dam operators are networked. They meet twice a year uh, to talk about issues related to flow and dam operations. Dam operators can change the way they manage flow just a little bit in ways that can benefit the ecosystem. This means that we can attempt to do things like keep a minimum amount of water in the channel during dry periods. It means that we may be able to use dams to dampen those spikes that happen when extreme rain events hit. In initial meetings with the dam network, what we heard from them was that we don't know explicitly how flow changes in response to our changes at the dam. And so we partnered up with the University of Michigan to pilot these flow monitors at certain spots on the river. What's beneficial about these flow monitors is that they transmit flow data in real time. So we know almost immediately when we make changes at the dam, what impacts that has on flow below the dam. A healthy functioning river protects us from flooding. It continues to provide high quality drinking water and all the recreational and beauty benefits that we've come to love about the Huron. The Huron River Watershed Council has been protecting the river for 50 years. Climate change is bringing a whole new set of challenges, but we can do things now that will ensure a healthy functioning river system long into the future. Okay. Get me back to the presentation now. And Rebecca, just about five minutes. Okay. Oops. Okay, are you guys seeing the slides now? Okay. Okay, so um, that gives you kind of that watershed view uh, protecting natural systems. Um, you know, a healthy Huron system is less vulnerable to and better prepared to bounce back from a catastrophic event. So this is the type of work we're tackling at HRWC. I want to shift now to what actions local governments can take and are taking to support uh, the health and natural systems such that they do the heavy lifting, um, uh, protecting us from the impacts due to climate change. Um, I like to say whatever you can do, nature can do better. This is something that I try to <laughs> communicate to others as far as, you know, our tendency to try to engineer ourselves out of our, our own predicaments. Um, nature is, is, a, is a miracle worker here. They, um, there's some, these practices here are some of the best in investments and often the most cost effective that we can make to reduce our vulnerabilities. So there's a few strategies I have bulleted here that ensure clean drinking water and reduce flooding risk. Um, source water protection uh, essentially means taking actions um, upstream of a drinking water source to ensure that the water is as clean as it can before it hits the treatment plant. Um, 
natural lands upstream of Barton Pond, which is our, the city's drinking water source, uh, act as sponges absorbing, absorbing rainfall and, and cleaning um, the water before it reaches the river. So by protecting land west and north of the city, Ann Arbor is protecting drinking water and also reducing flood risk. You get bonus points for this strategy because of all the carbon capture that protecting natural lands uh, provides us. Uh, you know, uh, natural areas sequester carbon uh, and reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, contributing to uh, the global warming. So I think this um, natural solution for mitigating climate change that we have with land protection and restoration is one of, one of the most powerful that we have in our toolbox of options and should be given the weight it deserves alongside some of our energy and technology solutions as well. A couple of other strategies including, include uh, removing non-essential dams and keeping development away from the river and the floodplain uh, with a note that floodplains are getting bigger than they were, have been because of the change in precipitation patterns and the way our storms are occurring. So our old um, rules may need to be revisited in this context. Um, the second set of strategies uh, are focused on uh, pollution reduction and public health. Whenever possible, wherever possible, reducing impervious surface is a good strategy. Our concrete, our asphalt, our rooftops, and if you pair this with large scale use of green infrastructure, green infrastructure, rain gardens, um, bioswales, preserving open spaces, street trees, that kind of thing. Um, all of this works together to, in the spirit of letting mother nature do what she does best and have her do the heavy lifting for us. Um, another strategy here is to keep that helps us keep as much natural land and open space available for this work in urban density is our friend here. Um, it decreases the overall footprint of a city and allows us to retain more natural areas. So climate change promises to deliver many shocks to our system that we've heard about over the course of the evening already. Maybe it's a catastrophic flood or a life-threatening heat wave. Maybe it's a severe storm that impacts an individual, your home or your business. Maybe it's shocks elsewhere, like we saw with Hurricane Katrina and with sea level rise that has people, new people moving to our city. And then there's shocks from other sources and coronavirus is shining a light on many of our vulnerabilities and our lack of preparedness. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the interplay of these things, as you might imagine. Um, and one thing is clear that our healthy and natural systems decrease our vulnerabilities, build resilience, and can aid in recovery. And I just uh, will end with a few examples for you to consider. I imagine a lot of us will be having uh, epiphanies or these moments of clarity about what the future could, like, could look like as we uh, recover from the shock we're currently in. First of all, access to clean drinking water decreases an individual's vulnerability to the virus. So you've heard about folks experiencing water shutoffs, that they, they, these folks cannot adhere well to the hygiene practices that are being promoted to slow the spread of the virus. There's also linkages between contaminants and um, immune systems. So PFAS, for example, has been leak, linked to decreased vaccine efficacy and also um, decreased uh, immune, or, um, immune system suppression. This is one example that's, that's particularly relevant in the Huron, but um, polluted water as a source of contaminants to humans is something that um, increases our vulnerability to things like a pandemic. Another thing is that the river brings is an economic um, recovery piece. So the river brings more than $2.9 million in direct spending to our watershed each year. Um, if people are able to enjoy outdoor spaces early, businesses linked to recreation and near our recreational amenities are going to benefit early as well. And so I've 
Um, this is something that the Watershed Council is going to focus on as we move um, toward uh, a little bit of an opening up and economic recovery. And then the last piece of it is personal well-being, which is something I think everyone is struggling with in their own way. The Huron River and area parks and trails have been a salve to many during this time. Our outdoor spaces are getting more use than ever as people are trying to find ways to take care of themselves um, during these times. And I can only imagine that this will persist in the months to come as we move forward through recovery from this crisis. So in closing, I'll just say we're learning a lot about our vulnerabilities right now. Uh, my hope is that it helps us all envision pieces of the future that need to be in place so that we can adapt when conditions require it and to recover stronger than when we began. Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead, Brooke, sorry. That's it really. I'm just gonna leave everybody with this thought because I feel like time and again, um, this is what the giving tree is, is telling us. <laughs> thank you. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you for the really critical work that you do at HRWC. Our last speaker for the night is Elizabeth Santiago, who is a Resilience Fellow in the Ann Arbor Office of Sustainability and Innovations. Elizabeth, over to you. All right, thank you everyone for joining. Give me just a moment to pull up this presentation. All right, here we go, let's get started. So tonight I am gonna be talking about resilience as it pertains to the A20 initiative and the city's carbon neutrality plan. And to give you uh, a little bit of action, oh, you know what? I don't think I am. Give me just a second. Thank you. All right. Can folks see my screen? Is that working all right? We're seeing a beautiful mountain. Yep. A mountain, oh no, okay. Anything different? Mountain, though. All right, sorry, y'all. Give me just a second. Elizabeth, if that doesn't work, I can bring up the slides here. I'm just downloading them. Is it working now? No. Hmm. Um, do you want me to, how about I pull up the slides and you can just tell me next slide and I'll click through. Sure, that sounds great, thank you. Can you see this everyone? Oh, fantastic. See that? All right, everyone, thank you for your patience. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about resilience as it pertains to the A20 initiative and the city's carbon neutrality plan. And to give you a little bit of background on that, Missy, if you wanna to go to the, the next slide. So on November 4th of 2019, Ann Arbor City Council adopted a climate emergency declaration. And in passing this resolution, the council pledged to develop a plan to achieve community-wide carbon neutrality by the year 2030. The draft of the carbon neutrality plan was unveiled on March 30th. And um, while today we're gonna to be focusing on this last strategy here, enhancing the resilience of our people in place, I do want to briefly highlight the other key strategies in the plan. I know um, some of you posted questions in the RSVP form about some of the other things that we're doing. Um, and hopefully we can touch on that a little bit more in Q&A but I do want to make note of these other things that we're, we're gonna be doing, but maybe not talking about so much this evening. And that is powering our electrical grid with 100% clean and renewable energy, 
reducing the miles we travel in our vehicles by at least 50%, changing the way we use, reuse, and dispose of materials, improving the energy efficiency in our homes, businesses, schools, places of worship, recreational sites, and government facilities, switching our appliances and vehicles from gasoline, diesel, propane, and natural gas to electric, and then of course the one that I'll be talking about today. And let me see if you want to go on to the next slide. So to achieve this strategy, we've identified six key actions, and that's it, preserve and enhance the local tree canopy, conduct asset and needs mapping of neighborhoods, assist in assembling and distributing emergency preparedness kits, implement sensors to monitor heat, air quality, waterways, and flooding, foster youth and neighborhood ambassador programs, and invest in resilience hubs. And I'll be touching on these more in depth, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the big picture here. And so let's talk about preserving and enhancing the local tree canopy. This action begins with um, understanding the local tree canopy, doing an analysis and creating a shared inventory to know what's already out there, as well as incentivizing shade tree and vegetation planting for private projects. And this is really important because, I mean, one, it looks nice, but also a properly managed and diverse urban forest increases resiliency against invasive insects that carry diseases and impact the human population. And by, plant by planting diverse tree species, the community benefits from increased shade and decreased heat island effects. So they act as a, a natural cooling mechanism while also supporting biodiversity. Let me see if you want to go on to the next one. So this next strategy involves working with neighborhoods to systematically identify what assets and needs exist in an area. Um, by understanding these assets, we can then activate them in times of need. Um, we can leverage them to create a plan that prioritizes and addresses community needs. And community mapping is so important because it leads to the identification of safe gathering points in neighborhoods. Um, so that may not seem maybe like the most useful thing during this time where we need to be practicing social distancing, but certainly understanding where we can create a space to secure essential goods and services um, is really important for a time like now. And so the more we know about our communities and our neighborhoods, the better we are able to activate our strengths. And then thinking about emergency preparedness, um, we have also identified this action of assisting and assembling and distributing emergency preparedness kits. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It involves working directly with partners and community groups to educate and help prepare emergency um, preparedness kits and plans that residents can keep for themselves. So we're really trying to empower folks in the community with these um, tools and these resources. And our vision is that residents have the resources they need to care for themselves and their families for, for multiple days should a disaster strike. We also are interested in implementing sensors to monitor heat, air quality, waterways, and flooding. Um, Rebecca touched on this in her presentation, why some of this is so important. And so we are also interested in focusing on um, collecting data and using sensors to proactively understand risks and mitigate vulnerab vulnerabilities in our area. Um, it is our goal to develop a ubiquitous system of sensors and monitors, allowing the city to proactively manage threats and risks while ensuring that Ann Arbor residents enjoy an exceptional quality of life. This is an action that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, community engagement was essential for developing our plan and it will continue to play a significant role as we move forward with implementing these actions. Achieving carbon neutrality will require mobilization of Ann Arbor residents on a nearly unprecedented scale. And so this action seeks to work with interested stakeholders to rapidly scale up um, our carbon neutrality work. And our vision is that through education and engagement, ambassadors elevate their voices and take ownership of this work, um, helping to drive significant community-wide action. These groups will lead a variety of projects related to energy and water consumption, waste reduction, recycling, transportation, and local food efforts. And all of these are actions that foster community resource stewardship, climate action, and social cohesion. So it's really important um, to make sure that the community is a part of this. 
and then resilience hubs. Uh, they are community serving facilities augmented to support residents and coordinated resource distribution and services before, during, or after a natural disaster event. At their core, resilience hubs are about shifting power to communities and increasing neighborhood capacity. Resilience hubs operate at the nexus of climate mitigation, adaptation, and equity. So we're really talking about resilience here the way that it was um, defined earlier in this event. Um, and they strive to enhance community sustainability and resilience through a bottom-up approach. So again, it's really about engaging the community um, because we want them involved on the co-development and leadership of this. Uh, our vision is to create a robust network of resilience hubs through which quality of life is enhanced, greenhouse emissions are reduced. Um, they really have the potential to empower residents uh, to take care of one, or, one another during a disaster. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things about the resilience hub framework is that it's intentionally designed to respond, respond to the needs and interests of the communities in which they are embedded. Um, so they could therefore play a significant role in increasing access to services well beyond those needed for disaster preparedness and response. Uh, thank you all for your attention. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to visit a20.org to learn more about our efforts and read the draft carbon neutrality plan. Uh, and with that, we can open up to Q&A. Hey, thank you everyone so much. Let me just stop sharing here. Um, wonderful presentations. I also was remiss at the introduction not to acknowledge that Rebecca, Beth, and Armando, who's not able to be with us here today, were members of the technical advisory committee that we had for adaptation and resilience that informed the A20 planning process. So thank you publicly for your service, the time, um, and the contribution you made to helping us really think holistically about how to enhance the resilience of our people in our place. We're great, forever grateful for that. Um, so let's see here. We have a few, um, looks like we already answered one question. All right, let's go back. Um, uh, one of the themes throughout, you did a brilliant job touching upon this, but I want to make sure there's nothing else you want to add is um, really exploring the parallels between climate and COVID. And again, both of you, um, in particular, Rebecca and Beth, address this. Is there anything else that you want to identify or put on the table as you're thinking about this long-term um, challenge, climate change, that of course has impacts immediately, and this crisis kind of instantaneous space that we're in with COVID. Anything you want to share about the similarities in terms of adaptation and resilience work that perhaps you haven't had a chance to touch on yet? I mean, I think one of the most obvious connections between these two is that we're seeing COVID-19 having a disproportionate impact on communities that are, um, that are underserved in a lot of other ways. So black, brown, indigenous people um, are being disproportionately impacted. And, um, and I think that the response to that in a almost unwillingness to acknowledge the depth of this crisis is pretty consistent with the way that climate impacts um, are affecting our communities today. And um, the opportunity that some people have to disregard or to diminish the impacts that climate change are already having in our communities um, is because they have a privilege of not feeling those impacts so severely. And so the more we can use this opportunity to think about why those disproportionate impacts are occurring, how we respond to them, and how we want to ensure that they are prevented in the future is going to put us in a better stead for ensuring that our response to climate change is also one that is rooted in justice and equity and helps us to avoid those disproportionate impacts. Yeah, I get, you know, um, that was very well said. Uh, one thing I'll add is that any crisis really shows you your weaknesses. It also shows you your strengths. Um, but really taking a look at where our systems are failing us um, can help us do better. Uh, next time, um, you know, so, uh, you know, it just has me in particular, and I, there's plenty of uh, commentary on this uh, in the news and elsewhere, is just really reflecting on those weaknesses and how our system 
when pushed to the brink uh, where where it fails. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Elizabeth, uh, this one, uh, I'll toss it over to you. Can you talk a bit about, uh, in more depth, about resilience hubs and how they can actually help us reduce emissions while also helping us adapt to impacts? Sure. So there are, I think it's like five essential um, components of a resilience hub. And one of those is specifically focused on energy efficiency and carbon neutrality and being able to um, be self-sustaining in, in many ways. And so that is one of the things that's required for, for resilience when we're thinking just about that energy um, side of it. But in terms of thinking about resilience in general and how it can um, really move the community forward, I think it goes back to the community engagement piece and recognizing that this is something that is meant to be um, a partnership with the city and with other organizations, but really the ownership is in the community and the leadership is in the community. Thank you very much. Just a reminder to folks still on the line that you're welcome to actually raise your hand and I can unmute you to ask a question if you have one, or you're welcome to type it into the Q&A box. Right now, what we're doing is reading questions that were submitted in advance of uh, today's webinar. So this one, um, Rebecca, I'm gonna toss this one over to you first, but Beth and Elizabeth, if you have any uh, insights into this, I would certainly love to hear them, especially Beth, the role that you play in the community in Ypsilanti. What are we teaching public school college kids about our local environment and any relevant indigenous and industrial kind of case studies? What are we teaching them about resilience historically um, and engaging in this work? You are muted. So the Watershed Council's Programming on um, for K through 12 and college um, age students um, focuses a lot on river health and the kind of full suite of threats that that um, that we face with our our water, both from a natural ecosystem perspective and from a drinking water, human health, recreation perspective. Um, trying to uh, instill a value about these systems, um, make sure they're aware of the multiple roles that systems play in our well-being. Not, they're not just a pretty place to visit and swim, but all of the services that they provide that allow us to thrive as a species. And I think with that as a foundation, uh, young people can move forward with an understanding of the complexities and the interlinkings of humans with, with our planet and our natural systems, and hopefully uh, move forward making choices um, with that underlying foundation. Thank you, Rebecca. Beth, anything you want to add? Um, so I think that's a really great question and I think that the integration of indigenous knowledge is something that across the climate community people are working much more intentionally and diligently to achieve here in our immediate area I can't speak to how that is becoming part of the curriculum but if you're interested in it there's a program that is called the GWOW climate literacy program it's designed by in a collaboration with um, the University of Madison um, and tribes in northern Wisconsin to put together a um, curriculum that helps students to bring together and reconcile traditional ecological knowledge related to climate change and Western data to look for where traditional ecological knowledge and Western data um, uh, relate to one another as we look at our climate history. Um, I can share those links after this. Here immediately in our area, there's a program that's funded by NOAA um, on climate resilience. And that program is a collaboration now between SEMI's coalition, um, which is the Southeast Michigan Sustainability Coalition, 
um, Michigan Sea Grant, the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment Program, and EcoWorks. And they're working with um, faculty, a faculty, well, yeah, right? Faculty in schools, um, still faculty, um, to develop curriculum in Ipsy community schools and also in WISD schools. And they're modeling work that was done in Detroit. Um, the neat thing about this place-based education program that they're running is it's really about what is community resilience. And so then the curriculum that the teachers are developing for the students comes from that. That work is, as far as I know, on a super pause. Um, but I was engaged in it actually as a sustainability commissioner, thinking about what are the sustainability and climate considerations for the city of Ypsilanti so that the curriculum was complementary to what our resilience needs are in the community. Um, so that's a really neat program, and I expect that they're going to have some great curriculum developed um, in the coming year or two as they go through that program. It's very exciting to see what emerges from that, for sure. Uh, just kind of a, a fun question that came up. What communities are doing the coolest, most successful adaptation work that you've seen? I, Rekha, do you want to go about like what watershed <laughs> stories there are or local watershed stories? Mm. You know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm thinking about that word cool. <laughs> In respect to this work, you know, it's, it, there's innovative work, there's, um, there's, um, you know, the hard work that needs to go into this, and there's definitely communities that I can identify that are doing the hard work um, already, you know, maybe in an accelerated pace compared to others. Um, you know, uh, actually Missy and myself are involved in a project where we're working with cities throughout the Great Lakes to um, do a vulnerability assessment of their stormwater systems. So they are taking a very comprehensive look at their infrastructure and their kind of people systems um, and taking a hard look at what the um, where their vulnerabilities are and where they're changing based on changes in precipitation patterns and, and temperature. And these folks, um, there's 12 cities involved, um, are doing the deep thinking and the comprehensive thinking necessary to arrive at a suite of strategies that they can then seek funding for and implement, uh, which might look different in scope or priority than a vulnerability assessment they would have done for a built system, you know, 20 years ago. So um, that work uh, has some of the front runners, front runners um, in our region on climate adaptation. There's several in Michigan, um, including Grand Rapids, Ferndale, and Ann Arbor, and then uh, several uh, sprinkled throughout the rest of the Great Lakes states. Um, cool things to me are really dorky, so I'm really into, um, recently in Broward County, Florida, the county was able to pass all new building standards and codes that were really well supported by the developer community. Um, and so they now have updated codes and standards for, um, their seawalls, for their building structures, and new zoning as well. And that was both great for them to have, but also it was something that was born out of a really close partnership between the uh, municipality, the county, and um, the private sector that's active there, um, developers, who were saying like, we want to be developing in a way that's responsible, but we need a, we need a floor. And um, we need you as the government to say like, what does the standard need to be? And so they were able to set that standard and were able to do it with a huge amount of support um, so that was a pretty cool win that, um, that I heard about recently. So I was into that. <laughs> there are uh, a couple of challenges that I want to highlight in talking about who's doing um, cool work in this area. So one of them is Resilient by Design in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
and the other is the Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge, and that's in a few different locations uh, throughout the United States. And I think what makes these so cool for me is their attention to equity in community engagement as they're looking at um, mitigation and adaptation efforts. So highly recommend looking into those. And then of course, I think what A20 is doing is also pretty cool. So um, very excited to be here in Ann Arbor um, as we move forward with these challenges. Yeah, I'm gonna take a moderator privilege on this and say that two things that I see around the nation that I'm really excited about are um, really serious deep investments in social cohesion and people. You know, when we put people first and we invest in those people finding solutions that work for them at a neighborhood scale, that is really exciting and it unlocks creativity and potential and addresses historical injustices in a way that is um, authentic. And I'm really excited when I see those models emerge. And then I'm also, this isn't perhaps um, coolest in the way we think about the word cool. So Rebecca, I'm with you. But one of the emerging trends is work um, that Beth and I are part of thinking about climate migration and how people are going to move, you know, over time, whether that's because of something like sea level rise literally making it impossible for them to stay where they are, or whether that's because wildfires and drought threaten existence in certain places. And that can be viewed as a really negative thing or it could be um, an opportunity if we really frame the narrative and plan accordingly. And for those who have heard us talk about climate risks specific to Ann Arbor, we talk a lot about three things. And you heard two of them pretty explicitly today, which is increases in temperature and increases in precipitation. And I think the third is climate migration because we do have water and we have a really high quality of life. And I don't want that to be viewed as a negative. I wanna figure out how we pivot that narrative and really make Ann Arbor a receptive place to lots of ideas um, and kind of cultures mixing. So I will step down with, from my moderator privilege. Uh, I'm gonna put something on the table for you guys. Rebecca, you talked about this, so maybe you wanna cue this up. We have a few questions talking about urban form and land use and its connection to resilience. And you mentioned this from the standpoint that urban density often reduces the demand in terms of sprawl. Is, is there anything else perhaps you want to talk through about that? It's a really timely topic. <laughs> urban form and what was the second part? Land use overall. Oh, yeah. You know, so this is, I've been in the field of watershed protection since uh, my entire career. And um, density has always been our friend. You know, we've, we've really, um, the, the more that we can consolidate our urban footprint, um, the more delicate we are on the natural systems that, as I've touted several times, are, are, are really integral to our success and well being. So, um, climate change is really amplified that, in my opinion, uh, both from the perspective of maintaining the functioning of our support systems, our, our air, our water, our land, um, but also from the perspective of uh, reducing our carbon footprint. So, um, you know, when you have more dense uh, urban areas and less sprawl, you are less reliant on vehicles and there are a lot of um, benefits um, to greenhouse gas reductions that can be achieved um, in, a, um, in a more um, dense urban environment. Beth, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, when I think about urban form, I think that the most striking thing that I've read recently definitely was um, the book that's out called The Future We Choose, which is co-authored co by Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivette Karnak, who worked to develop the Paris Climate Accords. Um, and, and in it, they talk about the future that we can choose. And it's a future that has a really, really beautiful story of, um, this one excerpt of it is like, it feels like when, when you're walking in a city that you're standing in a forest and it's because you are. And it's because we have forested, again, we have reforested our urban places and not in a way that diminishes that density, that diminishes the human space, but we've just become much more capable of like living in and among nature. And, and I think that 
this experience of COVID-19, I hope one of the benefits is going to be people finding that return to nature as something that they will preserve. Um, you know, when it is the only place that we can go, and so people are going there, as Rebecca said, you know, the HRWC, Parks and Trails, and all along the river is just being so much more intensely used. In you know, my family of 14, a six and a four-year-old, um, we've found parks that we've never explored before in this area, and it's been amazing. And I think that that relationship with being in nature is something that in our urban form, we really need to be able to reintroduce. And um, I'm an urban planner by training, and I went into urban planning because I felt it was really critical that our urban spaces are a place where form follows function, not function follows form, and that we carry the values. Um, so if those values are about caring about nature and caring about our neighbors and being in community, like we can make the form follow that function. Um, rather than being isolated and being territorial and being convinced of like only our own space is our responsibility. So I think about the way that we interact with the land use choices as really being about how we think about public good and um, public space as something that's shared. Thank you so much. I'm gonna throw two last questions out and um, then we'll see if any brave souls wanna, wanna jump in here. Uh, we've had a question about the connection of adaptation and resilience and food, in particular, local food production, as well as plant-based diets. Is there anything you guys want to add uh, to that question? I know we didn't really touch on it in the arc of our discussion today. No. The relationship between um, climate and, and, and COVID, um, the food system and food insecurity is something that my members and members in ASAP have put first and foremost in the member group that we have, which is learning lessons from pandemic recovery. Um, the first meeting of that small group was 65%, uh, 70% about food security um, and the idea of how do we use this time again, where a lot of people are turning to local or regional food systems and thinking about a supply chain that they can support at a local and regional scale. Um, as a vehicle for advancing conversations on social cohesion, on advancing conversations on community resilience and connectivity. And of course, you know, the more you get your lettuce from a local producer and less from someplace where it has to fly to you to get to your salad bowl, um, it's going to have a benefit. And so, I mean, a strong local food system is good for adaptation and resilience because it builds relationships and builds community strength and it's great for mitigation because it cuts down on um, the travel time that your food takes to get to your plate. Thanks, Beth. Great. Last question that uh, we have for you is, what is Ann Arbor's biggest opportunity to enhance resilience? What? <laughs> Softball for you. Yeah. You know, um, I think that the way that the 820 plan was developed with so much input from the community and lots of opportunity to engage and lots of different vehicles through which to engage, whether you attended a meeting or a town hall or a survey or however. Um, I'm, what I'm hoping is that um, a lot of voices chimed in and were heard and in doing so tuned in to the conversation and are therefore readying themselves for action and kind of getting excited about that future. So, you know, the, the opportunity I see is um, a local government can't do this alone. It, it, it requires all the residents, and as I mentioned in my talk, a lot of the neighbors too. But, um, you know, getting, uh, you need a critical mass of people ready to, to do the work, and it's not going to be easy, and it's going to require things look different than they have in the past, but it doesn't mean they have to look bad. And so just getting folks um, kind of on the train, I think, um, is an opportunity that the way this plan was created has created 
for the city of Ann Arbor and the residents of Ann Arbor. And I hope everyone just stays on that train and grabs friends and brings them on and we forge ahead. I would say that with what's going on in this pandemic, there are conversations that we're having about systemic injustice um, that feel like they're on a scale that we haven't had before. And so there's this recognition that there is no, um, you know, going back to whatever that normal was for folks, because for many, that was insufficient. And so we need to press forward in new and innovative ways that are equitable for all. And so I think we have a real opportunity on our hands here as challenging uh, as the situation is. Yeah, I think that Ann Arbor always has an opportunity to continue being a leader. It's been a leader in sustainability. It's been a leader in climate action. Ann Arbor is a city that everyone needs to lead because it's a small city and it's a city that has demonstrated the way that you have relationships with the university. It's demonstrated the way that you bring a whole community along on really ambitious and really, really challenging questions. Um, the opportunity that I see now is Ann Arbor leveraging that position of leadership in building collaboration on a regional scale that really talks about equity and justice. I mean, when you look at COVID-19 in Washtenaw County, the zip code that I sit in in 48197 is dramatically and disproportionately impacted. The opportunity for Ann Arbor to show that ambition and leadership can be done in a way that's collaborative and cooperative with its neighbors, I think is its next place to go. People want to look at Ann Arbor and see leadership. I do, and everyone does. And I think that that is a place where like, there's really a leadership opportunity in this moment. And I hope that the city will take it. Thank you so much, Beth. That is really uh, an inspiring way to close out our time together. I want to thank all of you for spending some of your evening with us. I know these are exceptional times. You are exceptional human beings and you are exceptional practitioners and it is a great pleasure to work with you. For everyone on the line or anyone that does come in to watch this later, just want to let you know that A20 is fundamentally about creating a just transition to community-wide carbon neutrality by the year 2030. To do that, it's going to necessitate that all of us all of us work together. So check out a20.org to learn more about the initiative or ways that you can get engaged. And please subscribe to our sustainability listserv to stay engaged, to get engaged, and help really build the movement that it's gonna take to achieve that just transition we're all looking for. So thank you all so much. Please stay safe, healthy, and uh, we look forward to working with you as we uh, bring in the new future we're looking forward to. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you.